Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, can I just add my own welcome to... Uh, hello again to everybody I was in the bar with last night. And uh, uh, good morning to uh, you know, the Cornish design community and research students. Um, it's very, very good that you come in at this point uh, to pick up what has been a really interesting and discursive and quite deep debate about design, how it's changing and its impact on Cornwall. So what I want to do very, very quickly is just give you the kind of <coughs> headlines um, from yesterday, the kinds of things we talked about and where we got to in our deliberations. And I realise that I'm, I, I'm going to be brutally paraphrasing some very kind of deep thinkers standing on the, sh uh, the shoulders of giants, if you like, Ezio Manzini, uh, Nabil Ham Ham Hamdi, John Thackeray, uh, and colleagues. Um, so forgive me, colleagues, for, for doing this, for taking and, and, and crudely summarising your words. But I really want to just um, say four things about what happened yesterday. The first point is design practice is changing and it needs to change. Uh, so how is it changing? Well, it's going from an old style, you know, production model, client brief solution, uh, uh, designing for people, if you like. And there is more new style, collaborative uh, designing with people in which um, passive test subjects, uh, the consumers of old, turn into active participants in the creative process. And there's, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Um, and this has all kinds of implications. Um, and we got to the point where we were talking about designers being very good traditionally at scaling things up. If you think of international corporate identity programs, global design solutions, buildings around the world all looking the same, uh, designers are very good and have been, have been very active in globalization. They're less good at scaling down uh, to make relevant local solutions and maybe new skill sets are needed in that area. But these emerging forms of practice do not invalidate existing forms of practice. That's, that's really important. Traditional models have just as much relevance. How they coexist is probably a subject for debate today. Why is design practice changing? Well, the challenges we face and the opportunities out there uh, for designers are so complex, interlinked and intractable uh, that we really do need to work in new ways. Uh, it's what one participant called wicked problems that require new forms of practice. So, you know, we have entrepreneurship, design entrepreneurship in the conventional model, allied to new forms of civic action and social innovation. And many different agencies, not just conventional businesses, but local authorities and development agencies and community groups and so on, they're engaged as clients and stakeholders and as co-creators in the process. So that's the first point. Design practice is changing, and boy, it needs to change. The second point is that, given the first point, uh, working in an interdisciplinary way will be very <coughs> important. But there is no interdisciplinarity without disciplines. And this is absolutely critical to thinking uh, about, about our identity as designers. Designers must bring a depth of design knowledge in their discipline to the table. And we made a critical distinction yesterday between design knowledge, which is specific to designers, and design thinking, which is more broad and generic and can be uh, carried out by everybody. And it's, it's this design knowledge uh, that designers need to have. And we also talked about the disrupt, uh, disruptive element of design, the asking of the awkward questions. And, and challenging conventional uh, production and procurement methods uh, is very, very important to the problem. So that's the second point about interdisciplinarity. Um, both uh, changing practice and interdisciplinarity um, have an impact on design education. And this is the third point. All of this has implications for how we educate, train, and provide professional support for designers. Um, and we had a big debate yesterday about what we teach and when. Um, should we just be discipline specific at undergraduate level and, and, and talk about the, the emerging forms of practice at postgraduate level? Some people argued that that was a good distinction, others, others not so. Um, and also, what was the research agenda? Um, you know, uh, um, and, and one very useful definition was that design research is about creating design knowledge that's useful to designers. And, and, and often design research goes off in other areas and is less relevant to the profession. If we're going to have a very, very strong emergent design practice, both the, uh, the academy 
and the profession have got to work hand in hand. And we talked a lot about issue-based teaching um, rather than discipline-based teaching and how you frame the problem. If you, if you set a brief which says uh, within a university, um, how do we design a disaster relief shelter? This just becomes the province of designers. It's nobody else's problem. But if you, if you frame the brief as, you know, how do we help displaced people after a disaster, um, then it becomes everybody's problem. And everybody from nutritionists to economists to engineers can get involved in an interdisciplinary way. So uh, the final point um, uh, concerns the distinct uh, and distinctive context of Cornwall. Um, Cornwall has a distinct cultural identity. It's unique in many respects, but it is also not alone. And we spent quite a lot of time looking at pilots from other regions of the world, from France, from Italy. There's an amazing project that Ezio Manzini told us about Milan, from Latin America and from North America, in which other regions are using design in a new collaborative way. So Cornwall, in a sense, is not alone. We know that there are some very specific issues around housing, around jobs, especially getting people over 50 back into work, around transport. We were told that 27% of um, carbon emissions in Cornwall comes from transport. That that's, compares with about 15 in um, Bristol. Uh, uh, so, so there are issues around transport. Uh, energy use, water, identity, and so on and so forth. I think the point is that there are other places piloting and trialling these things, and that there is an opportunity to learn and maybe twin with design communities carrying out dot-like projects uh, in other regions of the world and facing some of the infrastructure uh, and demographic problems that you face in Cornwall. And we were reminded by the author of Small Change, Nabil Hamdi, that if you want to do something big, start small. And this is a real call to arms for you as designers, because um, often you think, well, how can this small pilot project have an impact? <laughs> and and Nabil is, is a big advocate of, 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 of this kind of small leading to big thinking. And the idea is that you don't think too much before you do something, and you don't do too much before you reflect on it. And sometimes small things can lead to big change. And I think that should be a motto of how we go forward uh, with DOT. So, so those are the, you know, a bit of a whistle-stop tour around a very rich and discursive conversation. Design practice is, is changing and it needs to change. Uh, interdisciplinarity will be important, but there is no interdisciplinarity without disciplines. All of this has implications for design education. And Cornwall, yes, you are unique, but there are other people out there with which you can partner. You are not alone. And just to conclude, uh, if I paraphrase Clive Grinier from Cisco, who said, you know, now is a, you know, he, looked, he stood up, looked very cheerful, and smiled broadly and said, now is a crisis for design. Let's not waste it. So let's not waste today. Thank you very much.